something brushes against my leg, it reminds me of my dead dog, Sparky. Then it bites. I spring up. It's another rat, about a foot long, with a meaty pink tail. It's gnawing at my toe. I shake it off, but it comes back for another helping. I stand up and pump the little fucker back into the jungle. <laughs> it's morning. My throat is caked in ash and embers, and I spit a phlegm wad into the campfire smoldering, smoldering nearby. The loogie is so thick, it crackles like bacon. <laughs> this is how it is when you're starving. Everything looks like food. I don't have any water either. My canteen is bone dry. And the only potable water source is a two mile hike into the rainforest. The trip is too treacherous for one to make alone. It's dark under the forest canopy, and pit vipers lurk in the trees. Somebody's got to spot them. A bearded, middle-aged man is walking, or better yet, prancing by the shoreline. In one hand, he's carrying a small harpoon. In the other, a coconut. He has a large hunting knife and a leather... <laughs> he has a large... He has a large hunting knife and a leather sheath strapped to his calf. Other than that, he is entirely naked. He's also fat. <laughs> He's also very gay. And, ah, oh, shit. He's heading right for me. <laughs> this is not a dream. I'm a contestant on the first episode of Survivor. This is my reality. Good morning, sunshine, he says, <laughs> and flops to the sand like a walrus. His name is Richard Hatch. I say, hey, can I get some of that coconut? <laughs> Twelve other contestants have already been voted off the island. Now there's just Richard, three others, and me. And me. I'm three days away from the one million dollar prize. I need that money badly. I borrowed more than two hundred thousand dollars for medical school, and I'm broke. Richard carves a piece of coconut flesh out of the shell and hands it to me. You're the next to go, buddy. <laughs> Everyone is voting you off tonight. I know, I say. Before being stranded off the coast of Borneo in the South China Sea, I was a neurologist in Manhattan. The majority of my patients had brain cancer. I knew their only hope at beating the disease was to have a doctor with a sharp mind and a soft heart. So I tried my best to be that for them. But modern medicine is increasingly heartless and impersonal, and it's very much a business. Every diagnosis comes with a dollar sign. I wasn't interested in making money for the hospital or HMO. I wanted to help sick people. I left medicine the day I witnessed another neurologist snatch a $10 copay from the hand of a cancer patient who was having a seizure. What do you mean you quit your job? My friend John asked. He's a neurosurgeon at UPenn. Come on down to Philadelphia. We'll have some beers, and we'll talk about it. I started drinking on the train. <laughs> I was on my second can of Heineken and flipping through an issue of Time magazine when I saw an article titled, A Star is Borneo. CBS was looking for 16 ordinary Americans willing to be stranded on an island for a new reality show. When I showed John the article later that night, he said, you're an idiot. <laughs> that almost deterred me. A day before the deadline, I filled out the online application and mailed it in with my audition tape. I admitted, I hadn't saved any lives rafting down the Amazon. I was not a member of Doctors Without Borders. And the only time I had ever gone camping 
It was really just a ruse to trick a girl into having tense sex with me. <laughs> so Vira would be the very first vacation I had ever taken. The application asked questions like, if you could hold any political office, what would it be and why? I answered, first lady. <laughs> Big house, no job, that seems like a pretty sweet deal. <laughs> Three words to describe yourself. Sexy, genius, delusional. <laughs> Then I went to Toys R Us, and I bought several giant plastic insects, a butterfly piñata, and a stuffed monkey doll, and I scotch taped them to the walls of my shower. I turned the water on, took off all my clothes, and pressed record on the camera. With the water spraying me square in the face, I said the first thing that came to my mind. I just spent the last ten days in my shower with this monkey and these giant insects and I forced myself to live off of the dirty bath water and whatever hair I can collect from the drain. <laughs> so here I am, 36 days on the island, 32 pounds lighter, with 38 million Americans watching. And I'm talking to a fat, middle-aged gastropod who's wearing nothing but a Bowie knife. Yes, even out here, gay guys love to accessorize. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are no surprises at tribal council that night. The four others had formed an unholy alliance, and I am the last castaway standing against them. Sean, the tribe has spoken, Jeff Probst says. And I think he smirks just a bit before he snuffs out my torch. And then it's over. I applied for Survivor because I honestly thought I could win one million dollars. And I thought I could win it honestly. After all, I'm pretty good at Jeopardy. <laughs> I could do hundreds of push-ups, and I'm a strong swimmer. But winning because you're strong and smart is not reality or reality television. I lost Survivor for a lot of the same reasons I left medicine. I was unwilling to cheat, I was unwilling to lie, and I was unwilling to put my own personal gain above the well-being of others. Richard wasn't. Three days later at the finale, King Richard wins Survivor and the one million dollar check. I was one of the five cast off jurors who voted for him. I like to think that my vote put him over the top. He deserved it. Sure, he played dirty, but being as unlikable as he naturally is, <laughs> consider all the mental gymnastics he had to go through to not get voted off. After the announcement, I congratulate him with a big bear hug, and I tell him, Richard, you are a horrible human being. I know, he says, isn't that great? <laughs> and then I realized how much I love him for all of his nakedness. <laughs> Being voted off Survivor hurts, and it isn't the money. Well, it's a little bit the money. But I also feel unlikable, I feel stupid, I feel rejected. With 15 minutes of fame, more, rejection fo more rejections follow. David Letterman treats me like a donkey. So does Jude Law, Alec Baldwin, and Rosie O'Donnell. I'm given a VIP table at a swanky New York restaurant, but then the manager asks me to move so he can accommodate Derek Jeter. I leave the restaurant mortified and hungry. There is such a bad thing, there is such a thing as bad press, and I get plenty of it. Most mornings I wait to hear radio DJs saying, paging Dr. Douchebag, or paging Dr. Dumbass. Ex-girlfriends sell their stories to the National Enquirer. Other articles about me appear in People Magazine, The New York Post, Us Weekly, The New York Times, and The USA Today. None of them are good. But I'm a survivor. 
I am sexy. I am a genius. And because of that, I managed to build a successful career as a television medical journalist. That is, of course, until CBS News suddenly eliminates my position and my agents abandon me. I forgot. I'm also delusional. <laughs> so I'm a castaway again, but this time around, I've learned a few things. Fame is only good if it comes with money. <laughs> <laughs> nice guys don't always finish last, but they rarely finish first. And they should learn to love fifth place. <laughs> And when stranded on a deserted island, never trust the fat, naked guy prancing by the shoreline. 